in the street regarding health is hydrate. The new word regarding that is live, spelled L-I-V. So get out and live life well with products and systems made with new technology that you simply add to or take with water. You hydrate, lose weight, cleanse your system, gain energy, and it is all natural. Go to mylivezone.com backslash kawada to find out more. Live, L-I-V, zone.com backslash kawada. Let's all get out and live life well. Okay, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Dave and Tiff here for another sports podcast. And we're going to spend some time with volleyball on this episode because we're making this recording the Tuesday right after the Big West Men's Volleyball Tournament was held right here in Honolulu. Uh, I guess you could say, Tiff, as a voice of Universal Hawaii Men's Volleyball, a lot of expectations going into it, a significant major disappointment with the men's team, number one seed, undefeated, losing in the semifinal. But then on the flip side on Sunday, they are get the number one seed in the tournament that counts, which is the NCAA tournament. So we'll talk a lot about that. Our guests, volleyball related. And with your background, Tiff, why don't you introduce our guests for this episode? Wow, where do we start? Uh, one of the sons of former and legendary Rainbow Wahine head coach, Dave Shoji. And I'm still going to go out there and say the best libero in the world. Uh, four-time first-team All-American at Stanford, uh, Eric Shoji. Excited to have him on. We had his older brother Kavika on a few episodes ago, uh, going back to last year. But uh, very excited to have Eric join us from California. So he gets ready for uh, the 2021 Olympic Games, less than 100 days. Yeah, that's right. On its uh, rescheduled, uh, postponed uh, calendar now. And like you mentioned, Kavika, we got to get uh, Dad Dave at some point and then eventually <laughs> marry Mom so that uh, – we can have the entire Shoji clan, and there's still Sister Colby out there. So we got to bring the all the Ohana in there. So we're going to have a lot of volleyball to talk about with Eric later on. Um, I will ask him about the status of men's volleyball at Stanford University, and that may be something that he might uh, get a bit upset and emotional about because of the fact that they're abolishing that sport over at that campus, which I know you and I can't understand why. So. Eric Shoji will be joining us, uh, the best libero in the world, um, later on today. But let's let's start off, before we go into volleyball, let's start a little bit of baseball, because the news came out today that um, Shohei Otani, who happens to be my mother's favorite baseball player, <laughs> why? Because he's Asian and Japanese, but the talented Shohei Otani, great pitcher, great batter, um, got the win on the mound and also hitting from the plate. And... You know what? It's not so much about that he was able to do that and they're making it the first time someone has pitched and hit and won a game and since Babe Ruth. But I'm surprised that there is so much brouhaha about this. I know, you know, the way baseball is, Major League Baseball is, everyone's so specialized, especially pitchers. You know, you have your starter, you have your setup. You have your closer, and you have your closer against a writer, right-handed batters, and so forth and so on. And and I know those rumblings with the Anaheim Angels not letting him play, like letting him play both. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think about Shohei? Like, heck, if you were the manager of the Angels, how would you handle it? You spent the money. You spent a the lot. money on on uh, it's been a lot of money to bring this guy over from Japan and a very legitimate and a very good pitcher, very good outfielder. Yes, he's you know seen some instances at first base, but you spend a lot of money on him, and you might as well get what you pay for. And he's a, he's a, he's getting to become a very good and legitimate pitcher in the AL West and the AL you know division. The league, as far as it's concerned, give him opportunities. You know, I mean, yes, it might be a little bit different this year because, you know, spring training was limited. The offseason was limited. The Angels didn't make the playoffs. So you had a little bit more of a winter to prepare yourself, but to have opportunities to give him team practice, but also time in the cage to hit, time in the field to catch and throw, get let him become one of those all-around players that, in this day and age of specialization, it's nice to see players who have the ability to play in multiple positions do so. And, and not just outfield, infield, or 
closer or setup guy, first base, whatever, but to have a starting pitcher and an outfielder, it's awesome. I was always impressed how this Japanese guy is six foot four and 220 pounds or whatever. They don't make them that big usually over in Japan. But um, yeah, the I guess my thing is, yeah, you got this talent, use it. Now, I know there was some, some anxiety because he's been injury plagued since he came over to the MLB. He hasn't played a complete season. He's had arm issues. So... I think when he first came over, he had the arm issue and that kind of, you know, puts everything on a little bit of a screeching halt. Like, okay, is he prone for arm injuries? And so we can't pitch him that much or we can't play him every day because after he pitches, oh, we got to sit him out. Like, oh, come on. I mean, after you pitch, I've heard pitchers say like, after you pitch, you can still throw. You just can't pitch a game, a nine inning or a seven inning game right after, but they're throwing the day after to kind of loosen the arm up. So I guess it's more of a, like, it's a path no one has taken since Babe Ruth, right? No one, no team has had a player that can pitch as a starter and hit so well and play the field. It's like, there's no book on this and everything is by the numbers. Now everything is numbers and data and anal analytics and statistics. And I just hope uh, the Madden, the, the ma uh, manager for the angels, you know, what goes with his gut and says, <laughs> we need wins. Let's put the best out there. I would much rather see him pitch and play in the field as opposed to a position player pitching, which is, you, you get into those extra innings, especially on those getaway days yeah. where your pitching staff is pretty limited as it is. And, you you know, you have games, you go into the 13th, 14th, 15th innings. Uh, maybe a little bit different this year because you have the international rule to start the extra innings with a runner on second. Uh, you know, baseball peers may not like it. Uh, but if you're wanting to avoid those very late extra inning games, totally fine with not having position players pitching. Yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, good luck to Shohei Otani. All right. I got to ask you now, the Big West Tournament over the weekend, men's volleyball. I and my wife were totally upset after that Friday loss by Hawaii in the semifinal, which was their first game. They had the first round by being the number one seed. I mean, gratified that they did get the number one overall top seed in the NCAA tournament, which I felt they earned despite... But I sure didn't like that anxiety on Saturday and into Sunday waiting for the announcement. Um, your take on the whole what transpired over the weekend? How much time we got? Because <laughs> that's, that's a very loaded question you threw, <sighs> you threw out there. Uh, wow. Uh, it was a combination of a lot of things. Uh, you see San Diego arguably playing their best match of the season. Uh, had 10 aces. Hawaii, their serve receive, which has been their bread and butter for years. Uh, broke down career high hitting errors from out of Pata Punam. UH who normally hits around 370 hit 280 for the match. And again, this all at home and just a combination of factors. And it would have been nice to at least make the conference tournament final hosted at the university. But I think when fan we've, this is tough. Fans have been spoiled with this program for the last four or five years, and they've expected a lot. And, you know, and, right, and rightfully so, based upon who returned from last year and and all the offense and how good the defense has been, how good the blocking has been, and just the level of excellence this program has been at uh, for the last three, four years, going even back into 2017. And there, there is a level of expectation, not just placed upon the players themselves, from the coaching staff, but from the fans as well. And – to lose in a conference tournament semifinal at home to a team that was four and 14, who has been division two since 2000 and their rest of their athletic program has been division one uh, since the start, since the start of July of last year. Um, it's not good. It's disappointing. And I think that's the word that, a lot of people in Hawaii felt after watching that game on Friday. Was it tough to call for sure? Were, was it to witness arguably the best win for an opponent in their school history? 
yeah, as a volleyball fan, that was cool to watch. Did it did it did it hurt to have it happen against the team that you're calling matches for? Of course, absolutely. And like you said, for Saturday, uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of just waiting around until you know noon, one o'clock Hawaii time, and just watching matches, whether they were <laughs> provided a live stream or if you had to follow live stats. You knew there was going to be one team coming out of the EIVA. And Penn State was that team. They win their conference tournament. The first one that really had Hawaii fans on 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 edge was the Miva, was with Lewis and Loyola, because you knew that was going to be a one bid league. And if Loyola had found a way to upset their rival uh, to win that conference tournament, that would have been interesting. Luckily for Hawaii's case, Lewis won. In the MPSF, same thing. BYU was the favorite. They went at home. Then you get to the UC San Diego, the Cinderella story in the Big West uh, Men's Volleyball Championship against Santa Barbara. A lot of people wanted chaos. And thank goodness, Hawaii's sake, no chaos happened. Santa Barbara, the better team all season long. It was a nice story for UC San Diego. It just would have been tough to have a team 5-14, and 14, or 6-13 and 13 rather, make the conference, make the NCAA championship. And you would have had a Pepperdine, a UC Santa Barbara, maybe a Lewis, maybe a UCLA. Heck, we know the NCAA history with Hawaii and not just men's volleyball. You would have had two very good teams left out of the tournament. So I think the committee got it right. Very glad to not see any sort of chaos uh, Saturday going into Sunday. And happy that the NCAA committee rewarded the body of work throughout the regular season and justify justifiably slow. So justify justifiably slow. There we go. We'll get it right one of these days. <laughs> justified Hawaii winning the number one overall seed in the conference in the NCAA championship. I was a little surprised with that. I mean, I agree with it and they should have. I really think um, athletic director for University of Hawaii, David Matlin being on that five member selection company has influence and i've heard that with every selection committee if that school's ad is in the on that committee even though they're not in the room to make the selection because for obvious reason of a conflict of interest no way are his peers gonna outvote his school even though he's waiting outside the door so i know that had a big factor um i'm sure maybe byu is grumbling saying they should have been the number one overall seed because they won their you know, their conference tournament, whereas Hawaii got upset. So I'm sure there's a little bit of brouhaha with, on their side of things. But, um, yeah, the body of work, uh, getting the number one seed, I think, was well-deserved. I hope that loss is something where they can use it as, you know, I, I know they took them lightly. There's no fans that to generate the energy like they have been all season. So everybody was on the same boat there. But here is Hawaii at home, undefeated, beaten UCSD four times already. And you could just sense they took them lightly. And they said, we're the number one seed. As professional, as mature as these guys are, it's natural psychologically for that to happen. It just happens. How could it not? So I hope this is the eye-opener that will give them that kind of perspective saying, you know what, we cannot even a US, UCSD take them lightly. So... There's a week here in between until the championships. I don't know who made that schedule, but um, so we got a time, some time to kill before we get into the NCAA tournament. All right, so let's let's get ready for our guest. He is one of the best in the world. No, he is this. the best. Come on. He okay. is the best libero in the world. Let's bring it on. He is the best libero in the world. We're talking about our guest, Eric Shoji. He'll be coming up in just a few seconds. Award-winning Hawaii sports writer Cindy Lewis shares her love of volleyball and other sports topics with her new website, cindylewis.com. After nearly 40 years of covering the top events in Hawaii, Cindy brings her reporting flair and insight to the digital format for all to enjoy. Get the very latest information on University of Hawaii volleyball for all teams, women, men, and beach from one of the most respected journalists in the state. Go to cindylewis.com and you will be connected. Oh, we're so happy to be joined by our special guest here on the Dave and Tiff Sports Podcast. Uh, Tiff and I consider him the best libero in the world. 
he is uh, probably too humble to just agree on that, but he is the best libero in the world uh, out of Punahou, then played at the uh, Stanford University, won a national title there, has been with the United States national team since 2013, two-time Olympian, Eric Shoji. And Eric, first of all, thanks for taking some time with us over in California. Um, first question now, when people who don't know volleyball and come up to you and they say, oh, what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm the libero for the U.S. national team. How do you explain what a libero is? Ooh, good question. Well, to be honest, me explaining what I do is a little bit confusing and it throws people off. I mean, I've lived the last three winters in Russia and then I live in California, but then I was home during COVID in Hawaii. So it's all over the place. Um, when I explain libero, I, I basically say a defensive specialist who needs to receive the ball, um, play defense against the opponent's spikers and um, run the backcourt, have a lot of energy, communicate well, and be a great teammate. Uh, but essentially, I, I, if I had to dumb it down, I would say defensive specialist. Um, I would suggest also saying if you ever come to one of my games, I'm the only one with a different jersey, so it's easy, you know, <laughs> easy to spot me. Um, Absolutely. I, I yep. mean, I think after you know all of that, if all else fails, I'll be like, have you watched volleyball in the last 20 years? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, I'm the one with the different colored jersey. Okay, got it. So, yeah, that is part of it. <laughs> there you go. Um, I Okay, I can't fathom this because I have not had a life as grand as yours. But oh, please. <laughs> here's the thing. I can't comprehend what it must be like to have a national award uh, off the block <laughs> has the Eric Shoji Best Libero of the year award given to the best libero in the country. Um, usually it's these names are for people who are either at least retired, you know, you're still active, still playing at the top of your game. Um, a lot of times they're, um, they passed on. You're still alive. You're here with us. Um, and I think it was named even before you were 30 years old. So have you kind of grasped that your legacy has is so crafted in a way that this award is named after you and this position has kind of been really attached to you. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's an honor. I, I feel very privileged to have that honor. I think at the end of the day, would you like something named after you? Of course, but, um, you know, I, I never play thinking that I want an award like that named after me or something like that, but it's a huge honor. I always think about you know, libero is a relatively new position, so maybe they didn't have enough choices, but it is cool. It's nice. Um, a lot of the other awards are older guys than me, but yeah, it's cool. I think it's interesting when, you know, some of these winners, they start showing up in the USA gym and I'm playing with these guys that have this award in after me. So it's like, it's really weird for me. I'm getting up there and older and kind of the old veteran on the team, but it's cool. I think, um, you know, I play hard. I try to have fun and be a good teammate. And at the end of the day, if, if that's going to happen, that that's great. I know what I put into the sport and I, you know, I feel honored to have it. Eric, uh, the venue behind me, I'm pretty sure you remember it playing in 2016 over in Rio as part of yeah. the Olympics. Uh, favorite memory of playing in Rio? Ooh, well, on the court, I would say the, best memory was beating Brazil which was in pool play I think it's probably the best match I've ever been a part of we were backs against the wall we lose the match we go home basically and we have to beat number one Brazil we end up winning going on to win bronze which is probably the second favorite memory of mine on the court I think off the court um seeing my family really celebrate the the games and be there and cheer and be huge USA fans was awesome. I'll say that for the families, it's it's so much fun. I mean, I obviously it's a dream come true as an athlete, but there is some stress involved with the, with the competition. The families have a blast. It's insane, and it was so awesome to see them have that. And then, you know, I would have to say that closing ceremonies was more memorable to me than opening ceremonies. We were in and out of opening ceremonies. It was, of course, spectacular and amazing to, to go through. But we spent a little bit more time at closing ceremonies. It was a big party, a big festival, and something that I'll remember forever. I, I noticed you're wearing black. Uh, I'm wearing black as well. 
um, to see some of the pictures uh, on social media throughout last week uh, with the MPSF championship tournament uh, with your alma mater. Um, I'm sure if you got to see some of the pictures, but what was your take on the program? We, we know what's going on with some of these Stanford programs with the 11 that are being axed. Uh, after the ac athletic academic season here in 2021. But what was your take when you saw players and the entire staff sort of use duct tape to kind of make an X across Stanford, across the back of the jerseys? Um, you know, I, I agree with their statement, with their stand. I think it was absolutely shameful what Stanford does. I know we're still in the process of fighting it. I think they made the wrong decision. I think they gave the wrong reasoning. I think it's you know, pretty embarrassing for them. And they're they're paying for it right now with the press, the bad press, um, a lot of donors are pulling out. And if I could have been in BYU with them, I would have been doing the exact same thing. I would have been wearing a shirt to support them. Seeing some of those photos was very emotional for me. If I was there, I probably would have been with them, you know, crying as well. So, you know, I support that team 100%. I support that coaching staff. They were the coaching staff when I was there. So I know how much they changed my life, impacted me, my brother, my sister even, and I'm with them 100%. I stand by them, and whatever decision they wanted to do, I'm with them. You talked about the coaching staff, of course, uh, local boy Daniel Rasai from the Big Island, and then longtime coach uh, Ken Shibuya, yeah. and the head coach John Costi. Uh, what has that staff meant to you, not just when in your four years at Stanford, but what have they meant to you since graduation? You know, everything. They've been huge, huge supporters of me, of Team USA, of playing overseas. And um, they're just the best. You know, I think back in my college day, there are three coaches that instilled a sort of confidence in myself. They trusted me 100%, even when I didn't feel like it. They trusted my brother. They trusted our entire team. And to know that they followed me, you know, I'm, I'm, what am I like nine years out of college? They still know what I'm doing, where I am, what I'm doing and playing. So they mean everything to me. And I was heartbroken, you know, when that decision was made and probably a whole lot of that was because of the coaches and just the uncertainty of the future. You've been around the world. You're, you're playing professional ball. You're a pretty good tennis player as well, and that's putting it mildly. <laughs> try, try. But, but you also have, it seems, a lot of time during the women's season to look at the bracket, see teams that are potential at-large you know, recipients. Do you think there's a future for you and maybe being a prognosticator for the NCAA Women's <laughs> Volleyball Selection I, Show? You know, honestly, I'm a huge nerd, Tiff. You know that every, every normal fall. I'm in it. I'm watching. I'm, you know, looking at stats and figuring out the seedings and the tournaments. And, you know, for me, it's fun. It's interesting. And I would love to do that. I think that I'm better than the committee <laughs> most years. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fan. I've always have been growing up in women's volleyball. It's just been a part of my life. So I still find it entertaining. I'm not, you know, one of those men's volleyball players that won't watch women's for whatever reason. I'm a huge supporter I love to watch it and I'm, a f I'm friends with a lot of the women's national team. So um, maybe in the future I could help out somehow, but um, it's just a hobby for now. We're joined here by Eric Shoji, member of the United States national men's volleyball team, Olympic uh, bronze medalist, former national champion with Stanford university, as well as uh, all ILH all state at Punahou. As far as in the schedule here, and I'm talking about with your U.S. national team, the Olympics are coming finally uh, this coming yes. summer. So what is the schedule now? We've kind of moved everything a year. Where are you in that kind of schedule of things leading up to the Games? So we actually just started official practice yesterday with the national team, which doesn't mean that everyone's here. People are still trickling in from overseas playing professional. But we have started officially um, UCLA as you guys probably know, was not included in the NCAA tournament for men's volleyball. So John Sparrow, our coach, is back with us full time. And we started practice. We'll be here in California for about a month, four weeks. Then we head off to Italy for, to play a four-week VNL, Volleyball Nations League. It will be in a bubble in Italy. 
And that'll take us to the end of June. We'll have a couple of weeks and then hopefully ship off to Japan for the Olympics. So it's pretty quick. What have been some of the initial information as far as being an athlete going to Tokyo in terms of all the health procedures, protocols? Have you guys been given a little heads up as to what you're going to be expecting when you get there or even just before getting there? I think the only thing we've heard is that the, the village to the competition venues are going to be a bubble or try to be a bubble as best as they can just to lower the risk of, for the athletes. That's pretty much all we've heard. I think as a team, we're scheduled to arrive in Japan a couple weeks early to train at a professional team site. So that's probably where, where we'll quarantine, test a bunch, and then hopefully be healthy heading into the village. But we haven't heard much. I think it's one of those things that it changes on the daily. And I know I was talking to a staff member today talking about the Olympics or they had a meeting and she just said, it's a whole lot of, we don't know yet. So it's a lot. We've been hearing, you know, things here, things there, but we're not exactly sure what'll, what'll be the protocol. Eric Shoji joining us here in the Dave and Tiff sports podcast. Okay. If I had a son, well, I do have sons, but they don't yeah. play volleyball, unfortunately, <laughs> but let's say, you know what? They're, they wanted to play volleyball. What, what are some tips skill-wise that are must-haves as far as being a good libero? That's one. Second, is there any physical attributes? Like, you know, a quarterback, you want him to be at least six foot four and, you know, have a strong arm. Is there physical attributes that would make a good libero as well? So I think the, the skill part is pretty easy. We pass, we play defense, we set, we cover, we have to communicate. So as far as the skill set, it's pretty simple. It's, it is less than maybe an outside hitter or an opposite. So you really want to focus on passing. I think that's number one. Defense is number two and setting is probably number three. So get out there, you know, get a lot of reps. I'm lucky that I have, you know, this – this dad who's this old, you know, has been kind of coach <laughs> and, you know, really instilled um, the skill set in me and my brother, just skill, 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 rep, rep, rep. And I think that's really helped us get to the national team today. As far as physical attributes, you know, Dave, I'll be honest, I'm six foot, I'm a size 10, I'm waist 32. I'm a very normal person when it comes to physical attributes. <laughs> I'm not that fast. I don't jump very high. So it all comes back to skills and technique for me. Um, as a libero, obviously you want some reaction time, some quickness. I think in the six foot range is probably ideal, but you know, I've, the Iranian libero used to be about five, five. I've seen liberos up to six, five. So, oh, wow. you know, it's all about the skill. If you can play the game and your skills are up to par, it doesn't matter what you look like. I was just wondering if maybe your forearms, the flatter they are, the better to create a better platform. Yeah, like, you know, not some not, people not believe, pudgy forearms, you know. You know, some people believe that, and I've seen amazing platforms that come all the way together. Mine don't. So I think it's just practice. You know, uh, final question here, but Tiff, I have this vision of when Eric and Kavika were kids, right? His <laughs> dad, Dave, legendary coach of women's volleyball. I've seen your dad, Eric, uh, coach a baseball game. Now, I don't know if it was you playing or. Oh God! It was at Did he Manoa. get kicked out of the game because that happened? And he was <laughs> so loud. He was barking at his his. He was at the third base coach's box, and you could hear him from the parking lot. And I was thinking, wow, this coach is really strict and and tough. And it was him. I didn't know it was him. And he was like, oh, you know, he's very loud. Was he like? Okay, boys, we're going in the backyard and just put you guys in the corner and just hitting balls at you. I mean, was he like that in terms of skill development? You know, not really, to be honest with you. We we played a lot of games and competition at home, but volleyball wasn't really at home. It was always in the gym. We worked very hard in the gym. I'm one of those people that, and Tiff's mother, Cindy, can probably talk about this. I was always in the gym for practice mm -hmm. when my dad was coaching. So, and it would be more in the timeouts or during whatever drill or after practice where I would, I would practice a lot. 
But I think one thing that people don't understand is my dad was much harder on us in the other sports that we played, not volleyball, because I think he, he trusted that we knew what we were doing in volleyball. Whereas the other sports, tennis for me, and then for Kavika who played golf and basketball in high school, he was on us much more for those. So volleyball, we didn't hear a ton. We, we got the practice, we got the reps, and he was very much Dave Shoji as a coach for volleyball. The other sports, I think that's where like more of the emotional parenting came into play. So it, it's kind of a, a funny balance that people don't really expect. That, that is interesting. That is fun. We yeah. Tiff, uh, I was telling Tiff before you came on, we've had Kavika. We now got you. Thank you for joining us. We, we want to get your dad, Dave. And I hope you don't mind, we're going to ask your mom and your sister as well because Do it. we got to get all the Shoji's on to say we're the first ones to, you know. Bring, yes, bring I the think Ohana they would love together. it. Yeah. They would love it. Awesome. Hey, Eric, thanks so much for taking some time. I know you're just starting the schedule. I am a Olympic nerd nut whatever you want to call yes. it i am so looking forward to these olympics and seeing you guys doing well on the court thank you thank so you much. so much and one correct i'm i've only been to one olympic so far oh. trying to make my second so wish us luck wish me luck but yes trying to make my second one in tokyo uh good luck for that we hope to thank see you luck. so much thanks, thanks eric. eric appreciate it yeah see you guys bye over 30 years of experience of covering Hawaii sports and telling stories can be found with BedrockSportsHawaii.com. Hawaii sports writer Nick Abramo shares his passion for insight, news, and opinions, along with stories and tales in what he calls the inexhaustible universe of athletics. Football, surfing, hockey, yes, hockey, and wrestling are some of the featured content you will find on BedrockSportsHawaii.com. This past weekend, UFC 261 gave us one of the most memorable cards in UFC history in the return of a full crowd since the COVID-19 pandemic in Jacksonville. Now, starting off the night, Hawaii's own Kevin Natividad unfortunately faces another roadblock to his once promising young career as he loses just 50 seconds into the fight by TKO to Dana Bakari. Natividad drops to 0-2 in the UFC as he also lost his debut to Miles Johns via knockout. He is 9-3 overall now. To start off the main card, Anthony Smith shocks the world and defeats Jimmy Crute via doctor stoppage after the first round due to a leg injury that Smith gave Crute due to leg kicks to his lead leg. Smith has now strung together two straight wins and responded to the critics who said he should retire and has nothing left in the tank. Uriah Hall defeats Chris Weidman just 17 seconds into the first round due to one of the nastiest injuries in mixed martial arts history as Weidman broke his leg attempting a leg kick, the very first kick he threw on Hall. And I do not suggest looking that one up if you have a weak stomach. And if you recall, Weidman also defeated Anderson Silva via broken leg back at UFC, UFC 168, a very similar injury that the former middleweight champion suffered Saturday night. To start off the championship fights, Valentina Shevchenko continues to prove that the gap between her and the rest of the flyweights is miles long, as she dominates Jessica Andrade and finishes her via TKO in the second round. Rose Nama Yunus completes her comeback story, becomes a strawweight champion once again, is the first woman mixed martial artist in UFC history to do so, as she knocks out Zhang Wei Li in the first round just 1 minutes and 18 seconds in due to a head kick. If you are a fan of MMA and have not heard of Rose Nama Yunus's story, I suggest looking it up, as she even brought Joe Rogan to tears, the former host of Fear Factor, as he inter interviewed her in the cage following her victory. And to finish off the night, Kamaru, the Nigerian nightmare Usman, continues to show improvement as he knocks out Jorge Gamebred Masvidal just one minute into the second round. This is the first time Masvidal has ever been finished by knockout in his career, in his 50 fight career. And if you recall, Usman, a devout Muslim, has been fasting during this period of Ramadan, and he does that to the man who holds the title known as the BMF in the UFC. Two still and still champions cap off the night and one and new Rose Nama Yunus, the former champion, reclaims her belt. This is Jaron Kawada with the UFC report of UFC 261. Sticking with volleyball, this is something we've talked about, Tiff and I. Uh, who would we put on our <laughs> Mount Rushmore for University of Hawaii men's volleyball? I mean, 
here they are, you know, great season into the NCAA tournament number one seed. So the Mount Rushmore, four people for University of Hawaii men's volleyball. So I will let you let's go have first. You, I was going to have you go. No. No, I was going to say, let's have you go first. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you're the voice. I'm going to let you say who your four is. Wow. All right. Uh, let's see Mount Rushmore for men's volleyball. Well, I got, I have to go with you, Paul Cotts. Uh, okay. undersized opposite and pff, you watch his career two time to the NCAA tournament, 95, 96, uh, arguably one of the best players to come through this UH program. He would have to be on it. Wow. Where, where, where else do, where else do I go? Uh, Stein von Tilburg. I know it's a recent name. Uh, but you know, three time first team All American, and oh, yeah, first team All American on both the right side and the left side in his, in his same in you know, throughout his four years. I think you got to throw him up there. Oh, wow, where, el where else do you go? Uh, one of the best blockers all time in program history, Dayan Miladinovic. I know this might that might be an interesting one for you or for mm -hmm. fans that are watching. Uh, all time leader in the program history in blocks. Total block solos, block assists. He's up there. Run, uh, wow, that's three it, already. It, this this is three. I, I you you gave me this assignment a week ago, and it, it's it's still tough. <laughs> so I, I have I have I have two hitters. I have a middle blocker. Do I go libero? Do I go a setter? I mean, there's some there's there, Joe Worsley. I know it's another recent name, and it's. He's arguably one. He's arguably the shortest setter in UH history. Um, as you leave to go get your extra headset, I guess. Uh, player that wasn't recruited to be a setter in college, and he was only recruited by UH to be a setter. So that's my four. Two guys that played together: Joe Worsley, Stein von Tilburg. Yes, there are a whole lot of other people that could make this list. Mm -hmm. um, Dayan Miladinovic and of course Yuval Kotz. I know I'm. I know I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get some heat for this for players that I've missed. Maybe for ones that I've included. I don't know. But those are my four. Okay. That, those. Yeah. I mean, I, I, Dayan Miladinovic. I mean, and I will throw him. He's not on my list, but I did have uh, Yuval Kotz. And although he only played two years, one of the things I looked at is. When he played, not only how good he was, but mm -hmm. the impact on the sport. I know where you're going. I know where you're going with this. I got one or two people. You're going here. Those are so it's two... e to me. To me, it's either you're going Jonas Umlauf, or you're going Costa Stelharides. Costa Stelharides is also on my Mount Rushmore, and mm -hmm. he was a four-time All-American. And I don't care what the NCAA says, he led Hawaii to the 2002 national championship. It was officially vacated. Um, so he was, I believe, the first four-time first-team All-American for University of Hawaii um, and two-time AVCA Player of the Year. So, again, and I kind of attach him with the national championship. But going back to the Yuval Cots, that two years that he played, 95-96, were those two years where Mike Wilton and the head coach at the time, that's when that program elevated to this nationally mm -hmm. prominent level they were kind of knocking on the door a little bit up to that point but 95 they make the final four for the first time 96 they go to the championship game and lose to ucla in five but so you all being a huge part of that being the best player on that so those are my two and those and, and and fans fans recent fans know of how much of a rock star status this group here in 2021 has especially the group in 2019 but if you remember those 95 and 96 days, I tell you what, it was standing room only. It was lines to just get tickets. There were instances where players had to hide in towel carts mm -hmm. to go from the locker room across the walkway into the, into the stand sheriff center at the time was special events arena. Those guys were rock stars and those guys really transformed uh, the men, men's volleyball program in the mid nineties into what it has become the last couple of years. Yeah, I was at a lot of those games. I was at that national championship game against UCLA, which broke my heart, by the way. Um, yeah, so I definitely know that fever. Uh, amazing. Full stand sheriff center. Um, my third person, 
is Alan Allen. And he played from 86 to 89 under head coach Alan Rosehill. And a two-time All-American, he would end up playing for the U.S. national team. But aside from being a local player and the star player on those teams, that was the first group of players that got nationally ranked in the top five. So they actually were, I think, as high as number three in 1989 and 88 at some point. Um, But they kind of were the first ones to knock on the door as a national contender for men's volleyball he was an outstanding outside hitter. He had a lot of record. I think he has a career. He still has the career UH record for solo blocks, believe it or not. 6'2", hugely athletic, and man, could he hit. But he was also one of their passers, so he had great volleyball skills. But the impact, the first All-American star, if you will, for men's volleyball. And my fourth one is a real twister. Okay, I was thinking of Stein von Tilburg, too. But I'm, I would put Dave Shoji because – Because he started, he started it all. Dave Shoji was the first men's coach, coached for the first seven years of its program. He's obviously way more known for his women's team. But just check this out. I was looking at the numbers. So he coached the first seven years. His final season, he was a co-head coach. But his percentage was 628 winning percentage. Never had a losing season in those seven seasons. Again, starting from scratch. He recruited Alan Allen. Alan Allen came actually the year after he went just solely with women's volleyball. And we just talked about Alan Allen. Also hired Charlie Wade as his assistant coach at the with the women's side, who now becomes the head coach at for the men and has led them to their most recent success over the past three, five years. So I would put in terms of someone who started and developed the foundation for success, Dave Shoji. And people will be like, what? Some people forget he coached the man. Hey, your list is quite, quite good. Very good. But I think it's a tough thing. I mean, uh, oh, for sure. It's a tough way to just isolate four. Um, but I think our consensus of Yuval and you said Costas too, right? I did not. Oh, okay. I did not say close this. So Yuval was the one we both had. And I guess that's, I think everyone would throw him on there. And the, the amazing part, he only played two years. But how impactful were those two years? <laughs> Unreal. And then we Very could have impactful. more. After, after this season, you got players like Patrick Gassman, a four-time first-team All-Big West. Um, Rado, when his career is done, he's got to be talks about being on that Mount Rushmore of great men's volleyball players. I mean, the talent is amazing. It's it's a very international group that head coach Charlie Wade has been able to get throughout his tenure here at UH, and especially with how the scholarships go for men's volleyball. You only have four and a half, so it's very tough to get guys both locally and domestically, and then, of course, through the international pipeline they found a way to make it work. And whether a guy gets a quarter or a half scholarship, very, very rarely do you see a guy get a full ride uh, for men's volleyball. But for what they have, you have everybody buy in. And the goal, which for them is now two matches, and they get to bring home a trophy and raise a banner, and that's the goal. That is <laughs> – I think uh, I think Yuval Kotz got a full ride. Um, I, you know – you're probably your mother would be the be- better person to ask. And maybe, you know, probably, but um, I think when Mike Wilton was the head coach and those 95, 96 teams, Mike Wilton was one of the first to kind of bring in a lot of international players. I mean, you've all caught, you had uh, Nave Milo, Dejan Milovic, they were the core of that team that were all from, um, uh, from Europe. Israel, Sivan Leone, you could throw Sivan. in Pedro Zenia from Brazil as well. Uh, Jonas Umlauf from Germany in 2010 with Charlie Wade. I mean, it, the, you, you can go through the roster year in and year out and you have at least two to three, sometimes four international guys, even more depending on the year. But for the ability to bring guys over and you can credit the last few years with uh, associated coach Milan Zarkovic and for his ability to establish relationships with 
the amount of years he he has had in, in the international game to establish those relationships. And then when former UH players go and overseas to play pro and they're able to meet young athletes that are interested in UH and are possibly getting looked at, they're also able to share their time with those recruits. And there's a story, you know, Brett Rosenmeyer, former Rainbow Warrior, uh, was overseas and talked with Philip Umler when he was getting recruited. And a lot was credited to Rosie in helping to bring Humler over from the Czech Republic. So it's not just the coaching staff. It's mm-hmm. former players and just the connections you have around the world. Yep. And I really think uh, Hawaii kind of led the way with recruiting overseas. And it's kind of led to other coaches doing the same thing. But Hawaii, with their unique situation, they were able to figure out a way to get talent because they couldn't compete as well with the recruits in California because UCLA, Pepperdine, those guys would take all that talent there. So they found another way. So, all right, good stuff. Well, I want to thank our special guest, Eric Shoji, for coming on. Also, uh, Jaron Kawada for providing an MMA report for this episode. So we look forward to the University of Hawaii men doing well in the NCAA tournament in next, not this coming weekend, but next weekend. Call a good game. uh, Tiff will be the voice there over in Ohio. And then when you come back, you can tell us all about it. Sounds like a plan. All right. Until next time. That sounds fun indeed. Until, and hopefully not as much stress as this uh, past weekend was. (laughs) Until next time, uh, Dave and Tiff saying so long. And as always, wear that mask. Be safe. Right. See you later.